presentation of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding for this program is provided by the Lannan Foundation and the Missouri Committee for the Humanities. of us have very few original ideas in the course of a lifetime. Most of our original ideas come to us when we are young and inexperienced. And some of us devote our later years to trying to express the same ideas better, or to facing the fact that they are not nearly so original as they once seemed to be. Yet we go on to the end of our lives hoping to say something that we have never said before, that no one else has ever said before, something which is worth saying, something which is even true. And while we are under the illusion that we have found such a thing to say, it seems to us at the moment the best offering that we can possibly make to any audience. He was an extremely discreet, if you wish, elusive type of man. He hated confessions. He hated the, the personal pronoun I. Mr. Elliot was a wonderful poet, but was disguised as a businessman or bank clerk, uh, wore a bowler hat, carried a fold umbrella, was always meticulous and polite and so on. And you're dressed as a businessman because he didn't want to appear as the poet. He didn't want to parade these titles of, of poet. He didn't affect to be able to be a revealer of hidden things. A poet may believe that he is expressing only his private experience. His lines may be for him only a means of talking about himself without giving himself away. Yet for his readers, what he has written may come to be the expression both of their own secret feelings and of the exaltation or despair of a generation. Elliot came here to East Coker only once on a warm afternoon in the summer of 1937. It's remarkable that this little village should be so powerfully associated with his work so as to form a sort of emblem of his whole career. He came here to the village of his ancestors who left for America in the 17th century to escape religious persecution and he returned to find his beginning and his end, and his end and his beginning. Those memories of his early life in St. Louis with the Mississippi, his young man's life in New England, and the life that he chose in old England, and the place that he chose for the end of his life at East Coker, are related. One set of them is a transfiguration of the other. There is a strange lack of nationality, perhaps, about Eliot. That's why I think it's futile, really, to debate as to whether he's an American poet or an English poet. He doesn't see these as separate nations, as separate lives, but as versions of one another. In my beginning is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble, are extended, are removed, destroyed, restored, or in their place, is an open field or a factory or a bypass. 
Old stone to new building, old timber to new fire, old fires to ashes, and ashes to the earth, which is already flesh, fur, and feces. Bone of man and beast, corn stalk and leaf. Houses live and die. There is a time for building and a time for living and for generation, and a time for the wind to break the loosened pain and to shake the wainscot where the field mouse trots, and to shake the tattered arras woven with a silent motto. Home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated of dead and living. Not the intense moment, isolated with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment and not the lifetime of one man only, but of old stones that cannot be deciphered. There is a time for the evening under starlight, a time for the evening under lamplight, the evening with the photograph album. Love is most nearly itself when here and now cease to matter. Old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity for a further union, a deeper communion. Through the dark, cold, and the empty desolation, the wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrol and the porpoise. In my end is my beginning. The past is always in the present, the past by itself is nothing. It's a, a virtuality which the present brings to life. And the quartets are above all about time. What is time? It begins with one. Time present and time past are both perhaps pr present in time future. And the quartets are above all. The theme of the quartets is time. What is time? The dove descending breaks the air with frame of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharge from sin and error, the only hope or else despair lies in the choice of fire or power to be redeemed from fire by fire. The young writer certainly should not be consciously bending his talent to conform to any supposed American or other tradition. The writers of the past, especially of the immediate past, in one's own place and language, may be valuable to the young writer simply as something definite to rebel against. He will recognize the common ancestry, but he need ne needn't necessarily like his relatives. Some of my strongest impulse to original development in early years has come from thinking, here is a man who has said something long ago or in another country and another language, which somehow corresponds to what I feel I want to say now. Let me see if I can't do what he has done in the language of my own place and time. Did it what uh, Hemingway did, did it what uh... Gertrude Stride at dawn. He came to Europe in search of his roots. He lived modestly the life of the students, following lectures at the Sorbonne, and uh, wandering around in the streets of Paris to see what life was like. Rhapsody on a windy night. This was uh, written in Paris in 1910 or 11. I don't know very much about it now. It's an explanation. I must leave it to others to explain. Twelve o'clock, along the reaches of the street, held in a lunar synthesis. Whispering lunar incantations dissolve the flaws of memory, and all its clear relations, its divisions and precisions. Every street lamp that I pass beats like a fatalistic drum, and through the spaces of the dark, midnight shakes the memory as a madman shakes a dead geranium. Half past one, 
The street lamp sputtered, the street lamp muttered, the street lamp said, regard that woman who hesitates toward you in the light of the door which opens on her like a grin. You see the border of her dress is torn and stained with sand, and you see the corner of her eye twists like a crooked pin. I can't explain that now. <laughs> I recognize the geraniums, they're Jules Lafogg's geraniums, not mine, I'm afraid, originally. Adopted them. We had emerged from the 18th century, which had been soaked in sentimentality and tears. We didn't want that anymore. The shouting of the romantics, the, the heart bearing of the romantic also, had become tiresome. Symbolism is, above all, if one was going to sum it up, in a few words, the art of indirectness. And symbolism expresses the feeling of the artist, but without him uncovering himself. Mallarmé took reality, abolished it, replaced it by the poem. People were tired of the eye of Victor Hugo, the egotistical sublime of, of Wordsworth. That was ended, as romanticism was ended. Symbolism is post-romanticism, if you wish, and the reaction to romanticism. You need to something else, and the fall was that. And that's why Eliot took to him so readily a proof rock, for instance, is sheer love all. The wonderful thing about Le Plan for me is the mixture of hilarity. It's a terribly funny poem, but also deep poignancy, because it's about a trapped man. And you know that he's going to do that as long as he lives. To me, the depths in proof rock are really an underlying sense of horror, uh, a horror at what is going on in a drawing room, which makes all the kind of civilization represented by conversation of pretentious people in that drawing room, a terrible kind of farce, and the feeling that underneath there's sheer horror. Mr. Elliot, having tasted this uh, high thinking and high living, wanted to see what the other side of the town was like. He imagines himself walking through a part of the city that has a seedy life, sort of restaurants and oyster shells. But he's headed probably to some place on the hill where there's one of these tea parties. He edges in what fascinates him, which is the women. But there is a terror, there is a terror in him at his interest in the women. He sees the hair on their arms and it's a sensual interest and then he recoils from it. It was a generation in which women were changing from uh, being Juno or some kind of goddess into people, <laughs> you know. Suddenly they weren't wearing uh, uh, steel armor corsets anymore. And uh, it, it must have been a little puzzling for somebody, particularly somebody who came from the kind of, in quotes, respectable world that he did, where a woman was somebody who maintained the tone in a society. It has been called the first poem of the modern movement in the sense that it entirely gets away from apparent Victorian and Georgian ideas of, of tone, of cadence, and of, of form. It's a poem made up of fragments which have been coalesced at a late stage. It's a poem with a very, in quotes, modern sensibility, and it came as a, a great shock to the people who read it first. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. 
And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalades, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? To have squeezed the universe into a ball to roll it toward some overwhelming question? To say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. There was a kind of sexual demon in Eliot's early poetry, and it's really that of the Puritan. A frequent theme in Henry James is of a man who's living in a world in which people are going through the uh, uh, experiences of sex and love and these things, but they're doing them in a macabre and unfeeling kind of way, whereas the man who is impotent, or feels himself impotent, capable of having these experiences, knows their value and knows what their reality. His interest in St. Sebastian came uh, primarily from his first trip to Europe, where he saw a uh, painting, some one of them by Mantegna in, in Venice, of this young man who was pierced by arrows, and the image uh, attracted Eliot. I think it's partly because it represented for him his own feelings of self-disgust, that here was a, a religious emblem which also had direct relevance to his own feelings about himself. Eliot was the Sybil without the secret. He's the man who talks about secrecy without having secrets. He's the man who talks about guilt without having anything guilty to confess. He was getting away from a familial background. Eliot was a man who was a self-confessed virgin and remained so for some time, but who was fascinated by low life. It's the fascination of the timorous man, the frustrated or repressed man. And you see it in the poetry he wrote in France in that period, which is poetry of a solitary observer watching women, wondering about his own sexual state, unable to make a first move. Tom was so soaked in moral principles, in his New England puritanism, which he never shed off completely, that he never indulged in any kind of weaknesses which could allow him to mingle with his demi monde and participate in his life. Sexual experience was still uh, something awe-inspiring. Sex it depends on the way you meet it for the first time. And his first experience had not been good. And as he was not a man when he was in Paris who could go to a brothel, I don't think that he would be capable of doing it as a Frenchman would, as an Italian would, as a Spaniard would. Well, then you have the man. And you have the problem about this question of uh, sen sensibility and inhibition about sex. The licentiousness of, of city life it was one of his great themes. And the book you read there, Boubou of Montparnasse, by Charles-Louis Philippe, was about the prostitutes of Montparnasse and the pimps of that quarter. And in one of his preludes, I think the third, he uses uh, images from that book as one of his major themes. in the early poetry a curiosity and also a repugnance. Uh, I don't agree with those critics who, who think of Eliot as intentionally debasing the image of women in his poetry. His idealism is baffled, thwarted by his realization that women are merely people. I don't see this as extremely naive on his part but as perhaps a misdirection, an emotional misdirection at some point in his development. The third prelude comes out of the experience in Paris of reading the naturalistic fiction of Charles-Louis Philippe. The atmosphere is of a hard and rather hopeless urban world of struggle, of suffering, of certain defeats, but of obstinacy in going ahead. At noon in the hotel room of the Rue Chanoinesse, a gray and dirty light filtered through the gray curtains and dirty panes of the window. And there was the unmade bed, where the two bodies had left their imprint of brownish sweat upon the worn sheets. The bed of hotel rooms, where the bodies are dirty and the souls as well. Berta in her chemise had just got up. 
With her narrow shoulders, her gray shirt, and her unclean feet, she too seemed in her pale yellowish slimness to have no light. You tossed a blanket from the bed. You lay upon your back and waited. You dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted. They flickered against the ceiling. And when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters and you heard the sparrows in the gutters, you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands, sitting along the bed's edge where you curl the papers from your hair or clasp the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands. It has been said that he was a late Victorian, and in some ways he's probably the last Victorian. When Elliot arrived in London in 1914, it was, of course, the time of the war, but there was a great deal of literary activity going on. There were other American expatriates, prominent amongst them, Ezra Pound, but there was also a tradition of what was then considered to be radical literature, uh, particularly uh, Bloomsbury. It wasn't long before he got to know Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf, for example. Elliot met them through Bertrand Russell, who'd been his tutor at Harvard. Leonard and Virginia clearly fascinated him. I don't think he'd met people quite like that before. He met he met the wild men. He met the uh, people who shouted at the tops of their voices, like Wyndham Lewis, for whom he had great admiration. But in England, when Elliot began to publish, many of the people whom we think of as Bloomsbury were still potential rather than actual writers. People like Virginia were just beginning to show their strength. She and Elliot, so to speak, grew up together. They both had their way to make in the world. If you think of Elliot and Pound, a couple of young Americans in a, a strange country in the middle of a war, uh, nobody knew much about them, cared much about them, and what they wanted to do was to change the whole future of not just one art, but several arts with the Vortex movement. It was in painting, sculpture, all the rest of it. It is a function of all art to give us some perception of an order in life by imposing an order upon it. The painter works by selection, combination, and emphasis among the elements of the visible world the musician in the world of sound. No writer, however skillful, can say anything important for his own time or for any future time in a style, however good, that belongs to a past age. He was very keen on the new, but it was always the new which had a special and vital relationship to the old. It's no more use trying to be traditional than it is trying to be original. So he came up with a notion, which I think is based on the idea of, of the canon of the Bible, that you have a number of sacred works. You have to think of these, of Dante, for example, Sophocles, Homer, whoever they are, Shakespeare, uh, as out of time in some way, as, as not existing in a past, but existing in some temporal medium in which a new work can join them. When it joins them, they were all altered. He was raiding tradition. He was raiding uh, the past, which uh, was sympathetic to him, and which were, were, or seemed relevant to him, to the present, and turning it into his own kind of art. He writes the kind of poetry which requires us, I think, to see it as containing many bewildering minutes. I think that's a very important clue to the way his mind worked. It's a sexual expression, of course, but he uses it in a letter to Stephen Spender. But there must first of all be the bewildering minute. There must be a surrender of personality to a particular line or even a particular word. Then you must withdraw from it and consider what has happened. And then, if you like, we can try to say something about it. He was deliberately using a kind of idiom 
which was contemporary and modern. And in that sense, he was a very modern writer. They spent a lot of time musical. It was very much the thing to do for poets. Uh, people like Ford, Maddox Ford, claims to have edited the English Review in a box at a music hall. He wrote a tribute on the death of Mary Lloyd, the great performer, which he thought so well of that he printed it in his selected essay. When a language is in a state of energy, there is a continuous reciprocal influence of colloquial speech on writing and of writing on colloquial speech. Writers must take their language as they find it spoken. To Mark Twain, at least in Huckleberry Finn, reveals himself to be one of those rare writers who have brought their language up to date and in so doing purified the dialect of the tribe. He was not so much English as a Londoner, I should say. He really had a passion for London. When Virginia Woolf referred to him as the American all the time, there's a kind of amusement about it. You know, this perfect Englishman who speaks with a better accent than any of us, the King's English, is an American. There's a Londoner, he enjoyed his roles, and he enjoyed the role of bank clerk. Actually, he wasn't a bank clerk. He was quite important in the bank, although Bloomsbury, of course, considered him the humblest of bank clerks. Aldous Huxley once described to me that if you visited Elliot, he went saw several stories below ground, and the only attraction was the heels of typists walking across a sort of glass pavement above the, the office. This was at the period when he was writing The Wasteland. So you have the double image of this man writing what was considered to be the most modern uh, poem in the English language. Some people still think it is. Uh, at the same time as Eliot was putting on the perfect uniform of a banking clerk and going into the city every morning. Uh, his hours were regular. I think they were nine till five. Then he would go home and try to write. On the very first occasion I met Eliot, I asked him whether I was right to have the impression from reading The Wasteland that civilization was completely collapsing. And he said, yes, he did think this. And I remember saying, well, how do you think it'll end? And he said, it'll end with people killing each other in the streets. The edge of the Westland is the edge which had just finished a war, meant to end all wars, and yet it was a fiasco. The Treaty of Versailles was not working. Thousands of dead in the trenches, rats in earlier, rats in the mine. Wind, the wind is always a, a, a kind of disturbance on the doors, at the windows, and so on. Signs of tension. The Westland is, if you wish, a drama with many voices. Every passage can be read dramatically as embodying a character, and he leaves his poems in his head. Eliot in the Wasteland used what you might call anthropological myth. Uh, in particular, a book by Jesse Weston called From Ritual to Romance. But I think for him, such themes were very much convenient vehicles which he could uh, take up and put down when he had no more use for them. Certainly in the Wasteland, it'd be very difficult to see any kind of coherent mythic formula running through it. The Wasteland, if you wish, is a kind of rag bag in which everything, all his memories, were coalesced into one poem. There's no great sorcery in saying that this could easily relate to his relationship with his wife. His marriage to Vivian Haywood was extremely unfortunate and unhappy. The core of the wasteland is really the dialogue between two lovers who can't speak to each other and who carry on a tragic conversation of thought. There's talk about the hysterical woman who says, what is the noise, what is the wind? beneath the door. And some people have pointed to the fact that, that Eliot, in a sense, is talking about his wife. But I think that's only partly true. I think uh, he was using theatrical devices to a certain extent. He certainly showed that particular poem to Vivian, and she put wonderful in the margin of it. So it doesn't sound to me as though she was offended or upset by these references. At the time the Wasteland was written, they were quite close still. I think they both needed each other. They're both rather nervous, high-strung people, and they sort of fed off each other's nerves. At this point, he was a very deeply divided and deeply unhappy man. 
he was living with a wife who was slowly going mad, but at the same time, they were almost accomplices against the world. He was suffering what we can only call nervous crisis. He did, in fact, suffer a nervous breakdown and was sent to Lausanne for a while to recuperate. He went to Margate on doctor's orders uh, before he traveled to Switzerland, and he sat on a shelter by the beach and played the mandolin, which uh, Vivian had given him, and sketched people. They were sort of made for each other. They moved together like sleepwalkers. The Wasteland. The Burial of the Dead. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Starnbergersee with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the hot garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Rüsti, stamm aus Litauen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Mary, Mary, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. Frisch weht der Wind, der Heimat zu. Mein Irish Kind, wo weilest du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet, when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence. Ud und leer das Meer. The use of Tristram in the, in the poem is, is intended, I think, to keep in our minds all through the, the whole myth of disastrous romantic love. Tristan and Isolde's story represents sexual infatuation as disastrous as madness. Eliot's leading critical ideas of tradition of the necessary separation of the man who suffers from the artist who creates, all these things have precedence in romantic thought. And the idea too of, of poems as complex images which are not necessarily connected with rational discourse. The wasteland is a highly developed form of romantic poetry. Romantic thinkers and poets were very interested in the fragment. And what is the wasteland but the kind of apotheosis of the poetry of the fragment? When I first read Eliot, I read the wasteland, and I suppose I was an undergraduate. And it appeared to me a kind of crazy work. I mean, I think that we thought of it uh, uh, as rather as contemporaries of Allen Ginsberg thought of Howell. It seemed in a way a kind of hidden, obscure confession. He also wrote about subjects which were not considered poetic. And Eliot studiedly wrote in the kind of language which people actually use in conversation in the street. It used to be called, he'd do the police in different voices. Of course, there are many voices in it. There's the voices of, of men, voices of women, uh, the voice of Theresia, and a completely abstract voice in the last and greatest section of the poem. All this, no doubt, did 
point towards some kind of genuine dramatic power, because we do recognize that all these voices really do belong to one voice, to the voice of Elliot. When Lil Zazman got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, Hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. You want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did, I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set. He said, I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years, he wants a good time. And if you don't give it in, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know to thank, she said. And give me a straight look. Hurry up, please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. She ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. And her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please. It's time. And that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gallon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it off. Hurry up, please. It's time. Hurry up, please. It's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-ta. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Elliot was not a great writer for nothing. He sometimes reminds me of Singh, who was said to have put his ear to the floor of the pubs and simply wrote what he heard. Eliot's uh, observation of uh, people in society was extremely fine, very uh, accurately observed. While he was at Lausanne, he wrote uh, the last sections of the poem, which are some of the finest sections. Um, and in a sense, what you have here is a poem which uh, is holding Eliot together as much as Eliot is holding it together. It's a poem which came out of nervous collapse. Uh, but also, it's much more than just a poem about a nervous breakdown. It's a poem about the state of a world society in that period. Eliot considered the last part of The Wasteland to be the best part of the poem, partly because it was almost automatic writing. The people who are not poets talk about inspiration. But if you are a poet, you usually realize how very, very rarely you actually are inspired, and it seems to flow out without conscious effort on your part, writing The End of the Wasteland. All this flowed out faster than he could write it down. It was a sort of proof to him of inspiration and authenticity. Eliot gave Pound the manuscripts of what they call the Ur Wasteland, which was the wasteland we have now, but also uh, much more verse. Uh, much of it was parody, much of it was pastiche, uh, much of it was soliloquy. What happened was that Pound understood instinctively the music of Eliot. He understood the cadences of rhythms of Eliot. So what he did was he took that poem and with his red pencil he excised what he considered to be unnecessary stuff. He gave it to Pound and Pound cut off all what you call the unnecessary uh, story-like or recitation, recitation and left the blocks of the Westland, the block of, of, therefore, of feelings side by side so that you have a kind of collage. He'd been uh, pushing the poem about, adding bits, taking bits out. And then in Lausanne, the whole of the fifth section, what the thunder said, just came, as if he'd won it. And Pound knew this. I mean, Pound just recognized me. He didn't touch a word in it. That was fine. Stet is all Pound has to say about the fifth section. Ganga was sunken. And the limp leaves waited for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over him event. The jungle crouched, humped in silence, then spoke the thunder. Da, Datta, what have we given, my friend? Blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender which an age of prudence can never retract. 
I sat upon the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me, shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Poi se scuse nel fuoco che gli affina. Quando vi ha muti caledon, o swallow, swallow, le prince d'Aquitaine a la tour aboli. These fragments I have shored against my ruins, why then, I'll fit you. Hieronimo's mad again. Zapta. Dayatvam. Damyata. Shanti. 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 You can't really distinguish the subject from the language. You might say the language is the subject. And the language is this kind of biblical language, although in a modern idiom. The wasteland is about the voice that underlies everything, which is the voice of religion, although it, it doesn't become fully realized in the wasteland. Empson once said to me that Eliot amazed him was Eliot really did have a medieval mind, that he did really think of a religion in which there was hell and damnation. All these things which people in the Middle Ages believed in were very real to him. Some men have had a deep conviction of their destiny and in that conviction have prospered. But when they cease to act as an instrument and think of themselves as the active source of what they do, their pride is punished by disaster. The concept of destiny leaves us with a mystery. But it is a mystery not contrary to reason, for it implies that the world and the course of human history have meaning. Only in humility, charity, and purity can we be prepared to receive the grace of God without which human operations are vain. By the time the Ash Wednesday poems were written, he had a religious commitment, which he did not have at the time of the Wasteland, but that only part of a much more complicated evolution. I suppose one could say that the voice print of the Wasteland is still there, but the difference is clear to everybody. There's a sort of incantatory, uh, almost liturgical quality, which is new to... Ash Wednesday. Because I do not hope to turn again, because I do not hope, because I do not hope to turn, desiring this man's gift and that man's scope, I no longer strive to strive toward such things. Why should the aged eagle stretch its wings? Why should I mourn the vanished power of the usual reign? In the world in which he was living, life was indeed meaningless. You doubted everything. Religion was ebbing away under the impact of science and materialism, and Eliot was very conscious of that, and strove very hard to try to make his contribution to the maintenance of religion in modern society. By the end of the 20s, he had found again in his faith, and he chose the High Anglican Church, which is very close to Catholicism. It happened in 1927, after a period of instruction in the faith, he did the formal act of being converted to the Church of England. The purposes of this were twofold. One, the Church of England offered Eliot some hope for himself, and I think Eliot needed some resting place. But secondly, it attached Eliot to the English communion, to English culture. Hierarchical society appealed very strongly to him, and he loathed all forms of dissent. Politically, this made him a Tory of a very pure sort. He believed in elites, he believed in class, he believed that people should not move out of their class. He was my colleague, a philosophical imperialist, and therefore a royalist and a conservative and all the other things that followed. The Civil War became for him the critical doctrine of the dissociation of sensibility. And you can see why to someone of the age of Marvell or Milton, that the execution of the king really did mean dividing time in two. The kingdom old was being cast into another mold, but he used Marvel's words. 
So it was one of those once for all historical events and you could use it as Eliot did, I think, to give an exact date more or less for the end of a society of which it was possible in some ways to approve. He enjoyed the company of the dignitaries of the church. I think he found it pleasant. But Leonard Wolf once went so fast to say that Eliot's conversion was simply a way of becoming a bit more English. He was offered a job at the firm which was then called Faber and Guire. He was by then a well-known poet, and in a sense, Faber made Eliot. It made Eliot into the guru of, of, of culture of the period. He was responsible for publishing much of the verse we now consider to be the best English verse, Auden, Spencer, Hughes, and so on. One of the strange characteristics of Eliot's career is the sense in which he reverted to an almost priestly or teacherly role, which he'd inherited from his Unitarian background. Who are you? Eliot was commissioned to write Murder in the Cathedral, and he took up the commission willingly. But for him, Murder in the Cathedral and succeeding verse plays offered a double advantage. It allowed him to practice poetry, but it also offered a convenient home for his religious sensibility. Who are you? As you do not know me, I do not need a name. And as you know me, that is why I come. You know me but have never seen my face. To meet before was never time or place. Traitor! 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 If I set out to write a play, I start by an act of choice. I settle upon a particular emotional situation out of which characters and a plot will emerge. And then lines of poetry may come into being, not from the original impulse, but from a secondary stimulation of the unconscious mind. For the effect of first-rate verse drama should be to make us believe that there are moments in life when poetry is the natural form of expression of ordinary men and women. The idea of a play in poetry was a terrific challenge to make that contemporary play still in verse, and many people resented it. But Eliot has said in an essay somewhere that the height of, of uh, emotion is always expressed in poetry. The cocktail party builds up into the most incredible hothouse uh, of emotion. After the enormous success of the cocktail party, there was an enormous influx of reporters from America. And I remember very well uh, all these light bulbs. This is in 1949. All these light bulbs, these flash bulbs, all lying all over the stage, like thousands of little eggs. In the 40s and the 50s, which was the time of his preeminent fame, he was a man who seemed almost close to death. He did not seem to be able to enjoy his fame. At the very end of his life, he married a lady called Valerie Fletcher, his secretary from Faber's. This was the consummation he had always been waiting for. He was revivified. He found new comfort, new security. I've always believed that he found in, in Miss Fletcher what he had found as a child in his family in St. Louis, Missouri. He found feminine comfort and protectiveness. He said at the end of his life that he'd paid too high a price to be a poet, that he'd suffered too much for what he had achieved. interest in drama sprang from a frustration about his own powers as a pure poet. There were often periods in his life where he didn't think he'd ever write poetry again. Well, then the war came, you see, and uh, then one had other duties and, and uh, things to do. And, uh, one was here and there, and one didn't have time, connected time, for writing a play. So I turned to writing the quartets. They came in, they occupied the war years very well. I was able, in the conditions in which I was living, to write poems of that type and that length. I wrote him at the time and asked him whether he had been listening to the last five quartets of Beethoven, particularly the one in A minor, uh, when he wrote the four quartets. And he wrote back and said, yes, he had. 
and he'd played it again and again. And he thought this expressed a kind of mystery and suffering, he said, suffering, uh, which was unattainable to him. But this is what he hoped to attain in poetry. He aimed at absolute transparency. There was no flesh, as it were. The imagined you could have a poetry so pure, so transparent, that there was nothing between the eye and what it was referred to. most striking characteristic of the four quartets is the way in which these sequences are very carefully structured. Uh, they echo and re-echo each other, um, and one sequence in each poem, as it were, echoes its companion sequence in the next poem. Uh, I think its formal characteristics, but in some ways its most striking characteristic, the four quartets, are poems about a nation and about a culture which is very severely under threat. And in a sense, you could describe the four quartets as a poem of memory, but not the memory of one individual, but the memory of a whole civilization. Present is best when it is laden with the past or with dreams of the future. Because then you can bring imagination. The present is perception. It's what you see, what you feel. What you see and what you feel is never half as good as what you can imagine. And it is when you bring imagination to bear on the present, as Dante does it, that you can have great poetry. What you have in these poems is a sense of Eliot trying to return to some sort of rootedness in life, whether his own life or that of the culture which he attached himself to. So the whole of the four quartets, in a sense, becomes a hymn to the memory of an uh, imagined past. You get a sense of uh, nostalgia for childhood certainties. It is ultimately the function of art in imposing a credible order upon ordinary reality and thereby eliciting some perception of an order in reality to bring us to a condition of serenity, stillness, and reconciliation. And then leave us, as Virgil left Dante, to proceed toward a region where that guide can avail no farther. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and the new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together. Every phrase and every sentence is an end and a beginning, every poem an epitaph. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here now, always, take 
condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crown knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding for this program is provided by the Lannan Foundation and the Missouri Committee for the Humanities. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.